Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with the very talented alto saxophonist and modern-day jazz great, Ted Nash. Over the course of a candid and revealing talk, Ted talked about how his career began at 16 with a week in Hawaii and playing with the great Lionel Hampton. From there, he has gone on to play with the best in the business and to release a trove of critically acclaimed jazz discs. Currently living out a dream playing with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra with the great Wenton Marsalis, he retold some cool stories about his uncle Ted Nash, those early days he would spend watching recording sessions, what is going on these days, and another cool project is in the works for the future, and you will find out about it, along with much, much more. Ted is a force in jazz today, so please enjoy. Hello? Yeah, Mr. Nash. Yeah, speaking. Hey, this is Joe Domino with Neon Jazz. Hey, Joe. How you doing, man? Hey, man. How are you? Good. Good, good. You ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Ready. First of all, I want to start off with kind of a local flavor here. How did uh, Lawrence and Manhattan, Kansas treat you on your recent travels there? Oh, it was great. It was great. Man. It, was a, it was a beautiful, uh, beautiful audience. Um, yeah, it's quite, it's, it's you know, it's, it's one thing to, uh, to play in New York and, and do these concerts such as Lincoln Center, but it's just another thing to bring the music out to the people. It's something that I think is really important, and a lot of these people wouldn't have the opportunity to hear the music, and I, I, just, I think they're so appreciative of that, of that fact, and uh, I think it makes, it makes those concerts that we do in what, compared to New York, our, our smaller towns, uh, really, really wonderful. Wonderful. So, on the heels of your September 2013 release, Chakra, how is the album doing? How are you promoting it? Kind of talk to me a little bit about it. To begin with, that was an unusual project because it wasn't my concept. Uh, usually when I do a recording of my own, I I come up with whatever the theme or whatever the uh, um, inspiration is for the music. This was actually given to me, this idea, by a man who had been close to death and felt that the, uh, the reason he's still alive is because he was... Uh, by a chakra specialist and used Eastern uh, medicines to, to, uh, to overcome his illness. So he became uh, the jazz fan or somebody that I had worked with. He was a producer of some project that I was involved with. And he just said, hey, man, I would, I would love to you know, commission you to write a piece of music. And what I want you to do is make it the seven chakras. So, you know, a suite of pieces. That's so beautiful, you know. But I, I, I knew very little about chakra work. I, except for what you kind of hear about just because you can't help but to be exposed to certain things through your life. But I didn't really know much about it, so I did a lot of research and then uh, and then found the inspiration to write different movements based on the different chakras. So it was, it was, it was an intense amount of, uh, of research and getting to know it in different ways, getting to know the concept, getting to know it um, from actually having work done by a chakra specialist, and then I felt ready to start composing. Um, from there, you know, I mean, it, we, it, 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 for me, it's mainly about the music, mainly about the creativity, uh, the marketing, selling CDs, things like that are, are very important, but uh, I find that more important to me is just, just the idea of creating rather than, say, the idea of marketing. It's not that maybe I'm, as I'm saying that it sounds like a very bad business sort of acumen, but, uh, uh, I think the other stuff I'm, I'm not as good at, and uh, uh, you know that's just that's part of the learning experience for me is, is how to how to do that other stage of, of, of business. Absolutely. Well, speaking of projects, the Grammy-nominated Portraits and Seven Shades that sounded like a very cool project with all of the artists: Monet, Dali, Matisse, Picasso. Kind of talk to me about that as well. Yeah, that came about kind of in a similar way. It was a commission, but it was by Jan Lincoln Center, and it was just like a conversation, really, that Winton Marsalis and I had several years ago in Mexico. We were on tour. He said, hey, man, would you write a piece of music for the band, a commission, you know, a long-form piece, whatever whatever you know, you're thinking about, whatever you're feeling, some kind of theme. So I thought about it for a couple of days, and I thought about how much artwork has inspired me. I find that other forms of art are really inspirational for me and how they affect the music. Um, a lot of times people ask, well, you know, who are your influences? And people's answer might be, oh, you know, uh, Coltrane or Debussy or something that's more close to what they're doing. But I find that Picasso and Monet and Chagall are just as influential in terms of how I feel 
feel and how I how I bring that feeling into music. So it was such it was really a gift to be able to do that project because I was uh, not only able to use that inspiration to, to come up with pieces that I probably wouldn't have come up with just on their own, but by having that kind of influence of, of the artwork, these iconic paintings really helped to shape the music and helped to inspire me. And using um, the, the uh, artwork that was uh, provided by the Museum of Modern Art, they, they basically worked with me as sort of a collaboration. They allowed me to, to come to the museum at off hours and look at the paintings and, and really study them and feel them. I even brought my soprano sax to the museum one day and played to, uh, to a Picasso. And, uh, and it helped me a lot. It was, it was a really great process. Yeah, that's very cool, man. Um... So you were born and bred in L.A. How did being in L.A. kind of infuse you with that love of jazz? Well, L.A. had a great, does still have a great uh, jazz scene, but for me it wasn't as intense as the scene in New York. And when I started to tour a little bit around the age of 17, I would come to New York and I would, I would see that. I would see how the, the buzz and the excitement of, of music in New York uh, was something that was just was calling uh, to me, but you know, I grew up with the parents who, and, and my uncle, who, who were jazz musicians, and came out of, like especially my uncle, who, who had played with the Les Brown Band, and my dad, who cut, caught the tail end of the, of the whole swing era, um, big band thing, they settled into the studios, the commercial music studios in um, California, and did all these great film scores and TV scores. I used to go with my, my father, and I would sit in in the recording studio and sit sometimes behind my uncle and I would just listen to them record this music and it, it I loved it I mean I was just uh, very very um, excited about about music in general at that point and uh, there, there was a temptation to stay in Los Angeles and stay in the studios uh, but yeah, just the, the idea of being more creative and, and uh, in terms of my playing and, and going to New York just seemed uh, to kind of overwhelm my other other desires to do that kind of music and my, my father and uncle did. But I would say that, that but hearing all these great composers, like especially coming you know, coming to these sessions in the seventies when there was just such great music still uh, in the movies and um, I, I, hearing that orchestral works live sitting in there, it, it had a big it had a big impact on me. Absolutely. Yeah, you just painted a perfect Rockwell painting in my brain just what, visualizing you as a kid in that studio watching the whole thing go down. That's that's awesome. Um, yeah, I loved it. I mean, you know, like Quincy Jones and all these great composers doing TV music to go and, and to sit and hear that. It, it did shape me. It did shape how I do compose for a big band. And I've been doing a lot of composing for the big band. And I, I have to say that, you know, growing up in that, in that environment of film score music, has had a big influence on me. It's something I'm not running away from creatively. It's, it's just something I didn't do commercially as a way to make to make a living. Absolutely. So, do you have a really good story about your famous Uncle Ted that would be safe for the world to know? <clears throat> well, sure. <laughs> he, he was a practical joker to begin with. Uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> one time we was called, we were doing a, a, an outdoor gig in Chicago and he got uh, he, uh, started as, a, as it got cooler in the evening, there was no heat. He took some of the, some of the music and some of the stuff they knew bonfire on the bandstand to keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, when he passed away, which was about three, four years ago, um, Benny Golson, the great saxophone player, wrote me an email. He says, I just learned of your uncle's passing. And he says, I just wanted to tell you what what a great player he was and how John Coltrane and I, when we were growing up in Philadelphia, they were just a little younger than my uncle. Uh, we, we were quite a few years, actually, maybe six, seven years or younger. They uh, used to sit in the living room and, and put on records, and one of the records, one of the uh, musicians they used to check out was my uncle. So they said, so Benny wrote me this beautiful email about how much they loved my uncle's sound and his technique and, and everything. And I thought, just, that was amazing to have these great, I mean, iconic saxophone players, Benny Golson and John Coltrane, appreciating my uncle's music. Yeah, that's great, man. That's a great story, for sure. Um, so, so your lineage in gigging started at 16. You had a week in Hawaii, legendary vibraphonist, Lionel Hampton. Man, that had to be a real uh, 
real kick to the head to get kind of infused in that jazz scene, huh? That was probably the best week of my life. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> and I, I, I say that because I was 16, I had to get out of school and go fly to Hawaii, and we, we played every night in the club that was part of the hotel. And we were just swinging hard, I was playing solos, I was playing with all these great musicians, I was definitely the youngest guy in the band, and uh, during the day hanging out on the beach and eating good food. I mean, I just can't think of a better week of my life. Um, uh, I learned so much about dedication to the music from Lionel Hampton. This, this guy would play two-hour sets. He had no problem just to play all night long. Yeah. Uh, you know, guys, guys would be complaining, man, can we get off the band step? But you look at this, this man who just was so passionate about playing. Yeah. You know, it, it may be a pain in the butt to some of the musicians who kind of, you know, they just want to get off the bandstand and get their break and all that. But, I mean, I, I think you've got to learn that music is something that's inside of you. With someone like that, an artist like that, who is just so passionate about playing, you have to let that affect you. And I think that that was such a great example for me at 16 to see this historic, great musician who was getting on at age at that point, who just didn't want to do anything else but play. That's what he lived for. And I think a lot of people got that, and it certainly has had an effect on, on how I um, approach music. Man, that's a dream week. You're a teenager with Lionel Hampton in Hawaii. That doesn't get any better than that. Um, exactly. <laughs> so you're probably the uh, the youngest old man I know. So at 17, you were playing lead alto with Quincy Jones, tour in Europe, uh, Don Ellis, Louis Belson. Um, Toshiko, on and on and on. What was that like? I mean, it just seems like your learning curve went from explosion to explosion. It was interesting because when these things happen, you don't really question it. It just seems natural. It seems like everything came from a, a point that it was a natural development, a natural curve. But uh, I look back at it and I think that I really was lucky. I mean, that there, certainly because of being the son of Dick Nash and, and, and my uncle and, and my mother uh, being exposed and learning about music early it was helpful but also the connection meeting some musicians through my father definitely helped John Ellis the trombonist I mean the, the trumpet player but he, he studied trombone with my father because he had had a heart attack and the doctor said that the trumpet may be too, too much stress on his heart so he wanted to play again and studied with my father on trombone and that's how I met John Ellis and then when Art Pepper got sick I took his place and I slept in the band and, and started playing so these kind of things happened and I didn't really think much about them. I think about it now, the fact that I was able to play with Blue Mitchell and Cat Anders and some of these really great uh, musicians. And not only that connections to the past, Louis Belson, Cat Anderson, these are players that played with Duke Ellington and it's like that degree of separation. Yeah. It's very close. So I look back at it now and I think, wow, I really am lucky to have had that experience. And I think that that momentum that I had, I mean, I have to say that it seems like it was perfect, but it wasn't. I mean, I moved to New York. Uh, I got into a relationship with somebody, you know, uh, this woman, and, and, I, and she just was didn't allow me to feel comfortable about pursuing the music as much as I wanted to. And you know, you get into these kind of situations where I felt like there was then there was the following few years where my momentum went way down. I felt like I I was on the rise. I, I was I was making records that people were taking notice. And then I moved to New York and I became just a small fish in a big pond. And I. I these other kind of personal decisions and, and everything that took me quite a few years to feel like I did get back that momentum and I feel like I'm in that place now again for the last few years and it's uh, it's great to come back to it and I, I think that it doesn't matter that I'm older or not the fact that I'm here the fact that I'm making music that I have the opportunity to make music and create and be with some really great musicians it's you know it's worth the, the entire journey to be in this spot again yeah right on man you know Speaking of, you're in a world-class outfit, the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. What's that like? It's, it's better than, than I think. It's hard to explain to a lot of people what it's like because a lot of people have their own sort of prejudiced views about a lot of things, including bands that play other people's music. And um, there, there are a lot of great jazz orchestras out there that do only their own compositions. And I, and I think that's... Yes, it's really important and great, and I love the music, and we do a lot of that, too. But we also do a lot of repertory music, and at first I was hesitant about it, and a lot of people said, oh, man, it's a repertory band, and, and, and there's a reputation that the band has played a lot of older music, and, and I think that's starting to change. 
strange now. I think people are starting to understand that we do. We cover a lot of ground. We do play music from, from you know, 70, 80 years ago when we feel like it and when we feel like it's important to do that. But we do so much new music, um, and I think that people are starting to, to catch on to that. This band is, is really forming its own voice, its own sound. We have a, we have a leader within Marsalis who, who is an inspiration constantly to all of us. His work ethic, his, his want to always play his best, and to, to every concert is like his best. He, he, he never he never comes and plays half-heartedly, ever. And uh, I, I think I think we all feel really lucky to be in this band because it, it feels like um, a group effort. It feels like we all individually are all working towards the same goal. I've not felt that as much in many of the big bands that I've played in over the years. I felt like there was a leader, then there was a bunch of side men, and uh, people were struggling to get their solos. They wanted to stand up and say, hey, this is me. I think with Jonathan in the center, we appreciate when we get a chance to solo, and that, cause that's what we've worked on so hard all our lives, this is the ability to improvise. But we also love to listen to each other play, and we love the fact that we come together on something that really does feel like a group effort, a community effort. And that's the first time I've ever felt that in a big band, and I think that's a lot of that comes from from Lincoln's attitude. You know, it's interesting. The irony of jazz is that it's all improv. It's the beauty of getting up and creating it. But every time I hear someone talk about someone like Wynton Marsalis or someone that's a star in the jazz world, that drive they have and that excellence they bring onto stage is probably one of the most amazing things to witness firsthand. It is. Um, speaking, it is. speaking of that, what has Wynton taught you about music and life? What are the big lessons he's, he's taught you? There, there's some very basic things that he, he continually works with us and with himself on, and one is not to, not to play, play cliches. And I think this is really important, that when you hear a lot of, a lot of younger musicians, certainly when you're younger, you, you emulate the musicians that came before you copy what they played, and you, you develop a language that you that becomes the base from which you, you you find your own stamp and your own way of playing. But the problem is that so many musicians continue to play just language and not really find their own their own voice and their own personal way of playing. And I think that one of the things that I learned so much over these past few years with Jasmine Center and Winton is that it's not enough to just play the language, not enough to just play a bunch of bebop lyrics and a bunch of uh, cliche sort of um, material, but it's important for you to find your own voice within all of that language and always be reactive and always be uh, aware of how, how much you need to engage the musicians you're playing with. And then, therefore, if they're engaged, you create a feeling and the audience becomes engaged. A lot of people... A lot of people when they hear about jazz, they, they get afraid. They're like, oh, it's that crazy stuff. I don't really understand. It's intellectual. And they, but a lot of times when they come and hear music that is truly engaged, like some musicians who are really involved with the music, these, these audience members who've not maybe experienced jazz so much in the past will come away and say, man, I didn't realize how much I love this music. And uh, I think that's what we have to, that's what Winston is always trying to remind us, remind himself, is that we need to continually show the audience how great this music is and how important it is by showing how engaging it is and being engaged. And, and so that's a constant learning process for me. Absolutely. Speaking of learning, each album you've created, Conception, Rhyme and Reason, Still Evolved, In the Loop, wh what have you learned during each of these phases of your life as you've recorded on your own? You know, it's, it's very much similar to what I was just saying, is that... Uh, it's not about trying to impress anybody. And I think when you're younger, you're thinking about that. You're thinking, what can I do? What can I write? How can I play that will impress people who are listening? But instead, I feel more and more it's about how can I move someone who's listening. And that alters the way that I change, that changes the way that I improvise, and also changes the way that I write music. Because I'm not, I'm not trying to get every last bit of everything in everything that I do. It's like that's the kind of, you, you, you know, when you're younger, you want to you play all the notes, you know, you want to play every bit that you can that's, that's impressive. You want to play fast. You want to write as much music as And now, I understand that that's, that's not necessary. That you can be simple, you can, but as long as you get to something and you can move somebody with your music, that's what's worth all of this. And it's the patience to say, I have tomorrow to play something else. I have next week to play a different thing and, and just deal with what you're feeling and what you're hearing and hopefully other people 
absolutely. So, Ted, who are your heroes? Is there anybody in the jazz world right now that you look at and you're like, man, I'd love to gig with them sometime? So as a, as a journey jazz guy at this point in your life, what do you like to teach those that are younger that gig with you? What do you want them to take away from your ethic, your view on music, and how you live your life? Follow us. 
absolutely. So, what what were you thinking the first time someone came up and asked for your autograph? Uh, I think you got the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's funny because you know, sometimes people ask for your autograph, they don't really quite know who you are. They just figure you know you just play a concert and they they just need to have your signature for for whatever for their book, or whatever. Other people really do feel. Uh, personal connection to what you're doing and, and feel like having your autograph is, is like having a little piece of you in some kind of way. There's a beautiful movie called The Terminal. Tom Hanks plays the son of a, of a man who had passed away and he was getting the signature of every single person in the Great Day in Harlem, that, that photograph that was taken of all these great jazz musicians. And it's a great concept uh, for, a, for a movie to have this man who's trying to get the absolute last signature of all those people in that, in that, in that photograph, which happened to be Benny Golson. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's very clear you're a very busy, fulfilled guy. You've made music and you can just hear how how much it's full of life. What's been your key to happiness? My key to do what? What's been your key to staying happy in life? Well, there's, there's actually just very few things that you need to think about in order to be happy. Pages and pages of books and, and things that are all, all written self-help to to figure out how to make your ha ha yourself happy. But I think it's just pretty simple. I think number one, always be working towards a goal. Always have something in front of you that you're working towards. It keeps you moving forward and motivated. I think the other thing is always be uh, completely loyal to your own integrity. That's really important. Yeah. If you do that, you feel good about yourself. And... Um, drink lots of water <laughs> that's for sure that is for sure so you said there's a lot to do in the next 20 years 30 40 years let's say we get to that uh, golden horizon how do you want the world to remember when you sit back as an old man and think about your life the impact your music had on all these humans that have heard you play live and through uh, CDs and albums how do you want the world to remember Ted Nash I'm not sure. I, you know, I just uh, I want them to to think positively, naturally about all the all the work that I've done over the years, and 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 just maybe remember the music. You'd be able to still hear it and listen to it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't think much about my uh, legacy. I think some people think about that when they get to a certain point in their their life. Like, well, man, I, I'm working towards leaving a body of work behind me and and my legacy and. And uh, I don't know. I'm not really thinking much about that. I kind of like more being in the moment and just sort of working with now and today and what uh, what I can do right now to be creative and inspire people or, or whatever, or work with people. Uh, I mean, certainly it's a think of the future because you work towards these things. And I'm, I'm thinking about my next releases. I'm thinking about uh, summer camps. I'm thinking about what I'm actually doing in a few years. But I'm not thinking so much far far in advance that I'm thinking about a legacy or what I'm going to leave behind. I just uh, haven't really thought much about that. What, what What's coming up next for you? Well, I just recorded my my next CD. It's called The Presidential Suite. <clears throat> and uh, this was a commission originally by Jazz Olympic Center. We premiered it earlier this year. And uh, each of the movements are, are inspired by different political speeches that deal with the theme of freedom. Cool. And... Uh, some of these iconic speeches like JFK's first inauguration and, and Nehru's uh, Trist Destiny and 
Oprah is going to be uh, reading the Nehru. So, you know, we have these yeah. really great people who, who will bring a lot of passion to reading these speeches, and I think that's this is going to be a really amazing project when I get finished with it. Yeah, sounds like it. I love these projects you're doing. That's great. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. So, to kind of bring this interview into full circle, my final question is this. Of all the years and the travels that you've had on the road, is there a story... Uh, that, that's happened that's kind of stuck in your head that's been kind of cool like a fan related story I, I can't think of anything offhand that's really like specific that sums up everything I I do love when when time passes and I've met somebody who who is who is younger and I may not even remember meeting them and then I meet them several years later and they're established musicians and they say that you know a lot of why they're, they're where they are is because of something that I did or what I was involved with they heard a live concert and it turned them on and I, and I think that's that makes pretty much everything that I do so worthwhile when I when when that happens when I meet up with somebody later who 10, 15 years ago was a student in high school or was a student in junior high school and got turned out by this music it's happened before and I I, I, I just think that that kind of makes everything worth worthwhile right on that's a great answer man Ted, thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being interested in what people are doing out here and, and, and doing a, 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 your series on this. I think, it's, I think it's great. It's very, very much appreciated. Jeff. Absolutely. So thank you for having me. Sure, yeah. yeah. Right on. Ted, thank you very much again. Continued success. I love your music. Looking forward to the presidential uh, CD coming out and everything you have coming from here on out, man. I appreciate it. Hey, man, thank you for reaching out. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Right on, sir. Take care. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, L.A., and spots all over the USA, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Mr. Ted Nash for his insight and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or you can visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.